Right. Okay, and again, you guys just mute your mics for now so uh, Doug's uh, picture comes up on top. Just make sure you remember to unmute them <laughs> when, when we bring you in. Hey, Doug, can you speak for me and get you up on top? Test, test, test. All right, here we go. Welcome to the 495. I'm your host, Doug Sparks, editor in chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. And man, I need, Lou, I need this episode today. I need this episode. I've been looking forward to this one. Especially this, today, we need a cold brew. Yeah. Th this is the one where people watch me and say, man, I want that guy's job. <laughs> right? Yep. Uh, so the first thing, and I'm going to get right into it because we have so much to talk about. Um, before I even introduce the guests, I just wanted to uh, say congratulations to Adam Tokarts, the guy who wrote the article about these guys, the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club. Uh, he just had his third child, Molly, uh, on May 17th. So congratulations. Uh, nice. You know, we're going to raise a pint or a uh, half pint to uh, Adam today. And I hope you're out there listening. Know that we're thinking about you. Congratulations to you and your family. That was, uh, that was great. Um, I'm going to just jump right in with the questions because I have so much going on. My guests here are Marco Borba and TJ Catalano. Uh, I was telling him before the show, originally I would have said Marco was the clean shaven guy and TJ was the guy with the beard and you'd be able to know the difference. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, that has thrown the, the idea out the window. Uh, so why don't you guys introduce yourselves so that, that uh, people know uh, who is who? Yeah, so I'm Marco Borba. I am the uh, president of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, been with the club now for seven-ish years. Okay, and, and TJ? And uh, I'm TJ Catalano. I've been with the club for probably about eight. It's okay. been a long time. So um, Marco came in and we became best buds pretty much. So. Right on. Hey, so I have a question. When this article was being written, it was before the pandemic. Like, I think we kind of heard the news that something was going on in China, but the reality hadn't set in. And I think we did the shoot like the weekend before everybody went into lockdown. What does it feel like now that the, the article is out there sort of circulating, what does it feel like to see that? Well, one of the things that uh, we, we talk, we actually have weekly Zoom meetings now as a, as a club, so we can still have that connection time. Uh, but what that article has done for us is just highlighted how much we miss getting together as a group. Uh, mm -hmm. Because although it's fun to see each other's faces and talk, that human connection uh, is missed. And, and that meeting that we had uh, for that shoot was a great one at our uh, member Nick Reiner's house uh, out in air. And we had a really great time and uh, it just highlighted how much we miss getting together. Sure. How many people are in the club? Just shy of 40. Just shy of 40. And what sort of, what sort of person joins a homebrew club? Well, we run the gamut actually. Uh, we have uh, lots of individuals that are new to brewing and are looking to enhance their brewing skills. And we have members that, don't brew at all. Literally, we have a member that has not brewed. Um, so, I mean, essentially what we look for is folks that have similar mindset as us that are, you know, like to hang out, have beer, talk about beer and, and share their beer experiences, whether that's brewing or, uh, you know, where they go and experience new beers. But, um, it, you know, not, there's not a big checklist of things to join the club. You just got to be a, a decent human that likes to hang out and talk about beer and drink beer and provide feedback about it. It's almost, turn, it's almost turned into a culinary thing now, too, because now when we host meetings, everybody tries to make the best food. And it's kind of it, in beer and cooking is very similar. So it's, it's kind of taken its own path lately. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that's one thing I wanted to ask you is is do you sense there's a different personality type who gets into beer versus other versus say wine or coffee or other aspects of the barbecue, whatever? Is there something that makes like what would draw someone to beer rather than those other things? 
Well, uh, probably. Uh, so what, one thing that we've learned about craft beer, and you can see it sort of in the uh, trajectory of the craft beer industry, is uh, the creativity and innovation and uh, the experimentation that you see. Um, some of these other industries uh, might be a little bit more limited in how creative they can be. I mean, you see tons of wine when you go into a liquor store. But right now, if you go into a bottle shop, there's about a billion different beers. And, and the personality is just somebody that is – uh, you know, looking to try something new, experiment, whether it's what, what they're drinking or what they're making. It's that creative, innovative personality that is really drawn to, to craft beer. Uh, and you see it in, in shopping patterns. If you actually see folks that are buying, um, if you yourself are a craft beer consumer, chances are when you go into a bottle shop, the first thing you say or look for is what's new. What's different? What haven't I had before? Uh, you know, there are so many social media platforms out there now that track beer consumption, like Untapped is a really popular one. Uh, you'll see people that are finding beers just so they can check something new because it's <laughs> different. Uh, and uh, and that's, that drives a lot of the culture in the industry. And that's why we've seen a huge explosion with how many breweries are out there right now, because everybody is looking for localization and to try that new um, that new beer that's out there. Sure. Actually, I was wondering if this is, this is another question I had. Does this kind of spoil you in some ways? Like I would see this in the coffee industry where people would get so much, they would be like, everything was anxiety. They always wanted like the latest coffee beans. They were always looking at new ways to brew. Everything had to be higher and higher elevations. Does it become hard at a certain point to go back to the fundamentals and go back to the basics and just enjoy like a good clean Pilsner or like a like just like a basic beer, lager season. <laughs> it, it's probably the opposite, actually. Yeah. Um, we you actually come to appreciate those classic styles of beer uh, when they're done really well. TJ knows this. We've gone through cycles of, you know, how do we push the limits on what we're brewing or get the biggest baddest beers you can out there? To all of a sudden, all I want is a four and a half percent check pills. Like that's that's yeah. what I'm looking for. Serious. Yeah, that's good to hear. You know, my wife loves beer, but she just doesn't have a high tolerance for alcohol. So she's always looking for good tasting beers that are low ABV. And there's there seem to be more of them out there. Um, yeah. Right now, I have a Mexican lager on tap and I have a Irish red on tap, both of which are below 5%. And that's what I like drinking. You know, that those, those are my session beers. And I, I do like to, you know, have a barley wine or, or something like that. But that's like, I want to split it with somebody and enjoy it for, you know, an extended period of time with a cigar or something like that. One yeah. of our longtime members... He, he made this. He said this phrase one time, and it stuck with me. His name's Carl, and I use it all the time. Sometimes I like to sip beer, but sometimes I want to drink beer, which means I want multiple pints. And it's hard to do that if it's a thirteen percent barley wine. Although you know we've had those days. Sure. Uh, but but you know when you want to have you know two, three, four pints or at a barbecue, you're you're likely tapping into the lower ABV stuff. And there's a lot of styles that have become really popular recently that are. Uh, like Goza or some of the sour beers that are out there that are just inherently lower alcohol beers that are made for this time of year. And they're awesome to drink and you can drink a lot of them and feel pretty good. Yeah. Hey, when you're drinking all that beer, do you, do you have to, you guys look like you're both in, in good shape. Do you have to, do you think about that? Do you think about like, man, I'm having a long day. I'm drinking a lot of beer. Now I have to go hit the weight room or I have to run. Do you have to fight for that balance? TJ, you want to take this one? <laughs> um, I I personally I have a dog that likes to walk a lot so I walk about five miles a day. Um, it, I I do yeah I you know I'm sitting here in my yoga room so I I do like to you know try to find that balance in my life and um, right now during a pandemic it's 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 kind of it's kind of hard to you know turn down a beer when I'm walking by my my buddy's house and he uh offers me a beer on my dog walk i'm not going to say no socially <laughs> sure. just thing, you know so you know it's and those are the beers that i'm drinking a low alcohol you know you don't even feel it it's it's in you know you can burn that amount of calories no problem so yeah i do try to have a regular workout regimen i think it's important it's hard to think that you're gonna be a daily beer drinker or drink a, a ton of beer and uh, not pack on a few pounds. So I'm on a maintenance program to make sure I'm doing okay. But, um, you know, I, I'm also a believer that anything in moderation is totally fine. So 
Uh, you can maintain your weight and live an active, healthy lifestyle and still have a beer every day. Yeah. So speaking of the pandemic, uh, this would normally be the question I'd kind of ask at the end of the show. But since we have so much going on, uh, I'm going to skip to it right now. Uh, there are people who are going to watch this and they're going to get excited and they're going to want to start homebrewing and they're going to want to start doing research. Uh, I assume they can't join your club right now or they can't at least meet with you or it's harder. Uh, is that the case? And what do you tell those kind of people who are watching right now? who are like, man, I need to do this. I have extra time. What do I buy? Where do I go? What books do I read? Where do I start? Yeah, I'd love to make it seem like we're this super exclusive club that nobody can be a part of. But, um, you know, what we, we have people that inquire about joining the club all the time. And, and even during the pandemic, we've had lots of people reaching out. Um, just like everybody else on the planet, we've had to pivot and just think a little bit more creatively how we approach that subject. We have not shut off uh, getting new members into the club. But what we have done is uh, just set up our criteria to be a little bit different on how to do that. And the first thing we always say to folks is join our public Facebook page. Be a part of the everyday conversation. Show us what you're interested in. Talk to us about, ask questions. Uh, you know, just share content. Be part of the conversation. And we, like I mentioned earlier, we have uh, weekly meetings that we all get together and, and we talk. And, and what we'll do is somebody who stands out that's shown interest in joining the club will say, join a weekly meeting. Uh, hop on Zoom with us. Talk to us. And if we haven't scared you away by the end of that meeting and you still want to join and, and it seems like you fit in, because what we're ultimately trying to figure out is, A, if you're fit for us and if we're fit for you. And if uh, we check off those two boxes, then, um, you know, we, we usually extend an invite and people join. Uh, every year, TJ and I go through this cycle of, you know, we, we are, we're close to 100 percent retention every year, which is pretty amazing. We don't have a lot of drop off, but there are folks that drop off. We we do intentionally try to keep our club a little bit smaller. Um, so we don't, you know, have this massive boom. You know, we will probably have a massive boom of interest after this. But uh, but we know we don't just invite everybody to join. We want to make sure they are fit. And we try to keep the, the group small because it makes it more uh, meaningful to the interactions that we have as club members. Uh, but it's not closed. Anybody who's interested, join our Facebook page, Merrimack Valley Homebrew. And, uh, you know, if, if you're part of the conversation and you really want to join and learn more about brewing, you'll learn just by being part of that page. But uh, by joining the club just elevates your ability to learn even more. Yeah. And, and, and we're always open to questions from people outside of the club. We, you know, extend, you know, our, our knowledge to them through the, the public forum. Um, which is really cool sometimes, you know, it's always great seeing people maybe not willing to come to a meeting or they're, you know, that life is too busy, but they want to learn. And I love that. Like, cause I just love teaching and sharing my knowledge because I love beer. <laughs> that is the foundation of our club learning yeah. and development. Yeah. Now you guys also compete. So tell me about beer competitions. How does that work? And you've won some awards too. So what's competition like, what's your past been and, and how does that work for people who don't know? anything about what a beer competition would be like. Yeah, beer competition is like the greatest sport in the world. It's not a spectator sport, but you get to sit there and try beer and talk about what you think about it. It's like a meeting every every uh, you know couple of months. Uh, but yeah, essentially what it is, is uh, there are these guidelines that set the standard of what beer is supposed to be, all the different styles and what they should smell like, look like, taste like, all that fun stuff. It's called the BJCP guidelines. And we put on our own competition uh, that is a BJCP sanctioned competition where um, we have certified judges that come in and, and people submit their beers and we organize them by style and we judge them and provide people feedback. The point of a competition, yes, there's some bragging rights, a little bit of recognition, you get a cool medal, like there's all that fun stuff. But ultimately, people are joining competitions because they're trying to make the best beer that they can and they want that feedback. And it just uh, either justifies all the work that you've put into making this beer that you think it's the best and you say you know what it is the best it won an award <laughs> or um, you're saying you know what maybe it wasn't as great and i'm trying to find out what those flaws were and you have somebody who's essentially a professional drinker tasting your beer and telling you what it you know what are some of the flaws that might be in there so the next time you brew it you're making it a little bit better um, plus, plus, plus sometimes your neighbor will tell you it's really good when it's free <laughs> that's true true story you do always your beer is always the best when somebody doesn't have to pay for it <laughs> sure. uh, but then there's friendly competition right like we have uh certainly built up some rivalries out there where we'll um, have internal competitions where we're competing against each other and we kind of razz on each other or we'll have 
um, you know, some fun jabbing that happens. There's also other homebrew clubs that we're happy to pick a little bit of, you know, competitive fighting with and try to, you know, bombard each other's competitions and, and you know, see who's the best. Uh, but, you know, th that stuff's mostly done and, and, and fun. And, and again, just for bragging rights and to, you know, talk a little smack. But, but if you're looking for enhancing your brewing skill level and, and get proper feedback, you want to go to a BJCP sanctioned um, competition, which you can find all of them that are happening on the BJCP website because they list every event that's being put on. You submit your beers, you'll get certified judge feedback. Uh, and that's how you really start to enhance your, your beer game. Hey, do I remember correctly? Can people buy some of your beers or one of your beers in stores? Uh, they could have a couple, a few months ago. So okay. we, we were part of a competition called the Boyle Rumble, uh, which was a collaboration with uh, the Brew Network and Melvin Brewing Company um, out in Woods Hole, right? Woods Hole is where they are, TJ? I think so. Yeah. Woods Hole, yeah. Um, and so anyway, so well, we entered this competition. Uh, it was open to 200 breweries, I uh, 200 homebrew clubs. I believe 80 or so entered the competition. And uh, the top six uh, were, went to the finals, which was hosted at the uh, homebrew convention that happened in Rhode Island in 2019. And we finished in the top three. And by finishing in the top three, uh, our, we, you know, members from our club got to fly out to their brewery in San Diego brew the beer that we entered it was canned and distributed in massachusetts and uh beer only lasted about a week on the shelves it, w it went pretty quick um uh, now granted maybe we were the ones that bought most of it but that's okay we won't talk about that but we um we, we would we would definitely it was really cool to see our our logo on a can uh distributed onto our local shelves it, it was a, an awesome honor to be recognized in that way uh it was a, it was an ipa that we brewed with an experimental uh, yeast. Um, the recipe was by our member, Mike Switzer, who's out in Newburyport. And uh, it was really cool to to be a part of that and to brew on a seven barrel commercial system was really awesome. Uh, and then, you know, the ultimate reward was you had a beer on the shelf that sold out like this. It was awesome. All right. Marco, what's behind you? What am I looking at? This is my brewing system. This is what I, uh, I brew with. I, I'm in my garage right now. I'm sticking with a garage theme, uh, <laughs> just like you are. Uh, and essentially, I've got this uh, tiered three burner system that I wheel out of my garage into my driveway, hook it up to propane. And these are the three different pots uh, that are used to uh, make you know, one batch of beer. Okay. Uh, so it's, they're 20 gallon pots. Um, I can brew about a 15 gallon uh, batch at one time. You didn't start off day one with something like that, right? How Definitely did you start not. off? I start off with a regular old kitchen pot and uh, extract brewing, which is essentially taking a concentrated uh, wort, so basically a syrup that's adding the sugars uh, that will be fermented later into your beer. Uh, so I started with mi almost no equipment, just basically a pot and a spoon and uh, something to ferment in. And uh, that's where it started for me, gosh, 15, 16 years ago. Uh, and then over a year, the, these things turn into an obsession for folks. TJ knows, you know, you you start buying a piece of equipment here. The batches aren't big enough. You start sharing with people. You have, you know, five or six beers on draft in your basement. Uh, so it, just, it, it gets a little crazy. But, yeah, this is my current brewing setup. Sure. TJ, how would you get into this? So my best friend, Carl, that, which he, Carl, that he uh, talked about earlier, he brewed on a, um, I think it was a Mr. Beer kit back in, like, 2006 man. that was my first time too so. and um man was that beer terrible <laughs> um and it, and we took like a two-year hiatus and we um decided to take another go at it and um we we got a different system that was a little bit more um geared to um actual fermentation and uh it came out not bad um it wasn't great um you know we tweaked things along uh, along the way, you know, we figured out, okay, when we use, um, you know, filtered water, it tastes better. When we, when we mess with the, the, uh, chemical composition of the water, it gets better. When we, um, use fresher ingredients, it gets better. So, um, you know, there's so many things that goes into it and it's all science. And you asked the question earlier, what kind of people really get into this? And it's like a mix between, that technical science person and that artsy person. Uh, I think it's it's typically that blend. A lot of the guys tend to be like computer science or engineers or just like artsy. 
type people. Um, but I, uh, it, it's, I just love it. I, yeah, but, it's funny. But, Co- the coffee industry is like that too. And uh, people don't necessarily realize this, but a lot of coffee companies were owned by engineers who had an artistic side. So they left that world because they wanted to kind of express themselves in some way. But it gives them, you know, they, they have that mind where they can kind of put things together and they know how to build things and make things operate. So there's that kind of mix between, as you're saying, like science and art. Yeah, I, I remember in college I, I took chemistry and I never understood it because I had to. I'm, I'm a civil engineer. And I had to take chemistry. And it wasn't until I started brewing and having to learn about water chemistry for the brewing where I was like, oh, that's what that meant back then. That's what that reaction was. And it was so like it was beautiful for me, actually, to like to, to make that connection because it, 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 it really reinforced that. And, and I, it's, it's beautiful. What right. TJ, what TJ is not telling you though, the the real reason why us young folks get into beer making is because in Massachusetts you got to be 21 to buy beer, but you only got to be 18 to buy the stuff to make beer. Uh, so the second you can start brewing your own, uh, it's a, even if it's garbage, uh, it's still alcohol and it's still got beer and it'll yeah. do the job. So you can do that before you're 21. That's the real reason. Why. Okay. Hey, so uh, I want to listen to what you guys have to say about these beers. What I did is I, I went to Marco's house yesterday and I picked up a six pack and we're going to start with the, the sati. And you guys talk me through this. I, I, I'm going to, I have some glasses here. I'm ready to serve these. So you tell me as if I've never done this before, you know, how much am I pouring into the glass? What am I looking for? What's this beer? Yeah. So, well, I mean, pop the cap, pour it in a glass, standard issue, how you pour it. You know, no, nothing fancy, just pour it sideways. Okay. As far since we're tasting, are you guys going full on? You're like, well, you, you know, we're. I think we're working today. I think. I think we are. Okay. I'm done for the day. All right. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so it's uh, it's against my ethical obligation to work after this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm a writer. Yeah, and you guys know the, the history here. Yeah, well, right. first, first things first, cheers. Yeah, cheers. cheers. And here's to Adam Tokarts and his new baby, Molly. Congratulations. Uh, so the, the first beer we're trying here, this is a sati, which is um, uh, an ancient ale. It's uh, a Finnish beer uh, from Finland, if that didn't, uh, that wasn't obvious. <laughs> and it's a beer that was brewed um, slightly unique than what traditional beers are, are brewed with. Uh, this beer isn't boiled. Um, it's brewed with juniper, and they add juniper branches as a sort of preservative. So uh, typically when you're making beer, you are um, mashing in your grains, which means you're soaking the grains at a certain temperature to extract all the sugar from your grain to turn it into wort and ferment it. Uh, in this case, we're recirculating that onto on top of itself with juniper branches over the top of it. Uh, but it's a really sweet beer. It's uh, higher gravity, which means it has a little bit more sugar, and it's intended to be a an easy drinker. It's, it's kind of slightly higher alcohol than you'd probably normally be drinking at, you know, noon. Uh, but, uh, but it's meant to be more of a dessert type beer uh, that you'd enjoy with uh, friends and family at the end of uh, the evening. It's not overly sweet, uh, it, but I, I, it, it, the, the body on it's really nice. It's got a really silky body. It goes easily on the tongue. This is, this is really great. Yeah, we, um, uh, so the one of the things that's unique about this beer is it um, well it's supposed to use this baker's yeast uh, so not a traditional beer yeast and uh, we had a hard time really finding it so we uh, did, uh, the person that I brewed this beer with his name is Rick Callery and uh, we had a really hard time finding that yeast in the United States so uh, we did a lot of research to be able to find out what the flavor profiles were from that yeast and they're really similar to a hefeweizen which has those clove banana characters hmm. and um, and so that complements the juniper actually really well so we went with the more traditional hefeweizen yeast that we use uh, to make the beer but um, but yeah it's got good body warms you up a little bit it's uh, you know almost 10 percent alcohol um not ideal for when it's 90 degrees outside and you're sweating but um but it's it's a pretty good one yeah so one of the things we talked about before the show is is you asked me what sort of things i would enjoy and i told you to go exotic because i tend to like things that are a little bit unusual uh but i was concerned that people would be watching this we, we have some unusual beers uh on the on the flight today uh and i just wanted you to speak to um Speak to that. Do people come in worried that everything is going to be made with uh, 
you know, rare uh, seagull beak and, and all these kind of strange exotic ingredients? Do you have people who just prefer sort of classic styles? Well, right now, everybody's into IPAs, right? That's the, the craze. Uh, most popular beer in the United States is, or most popular style in the United States is an IPA. And if you follow us on Facebook, you'll see uh, that most of the beers that we brew are uh, just normal, down-to-earth beers. Uh, but like we talked about earlier, you know, we live in this um, age of experimentation with beer and trying new things. So uh, TJ and I, when we brew together, we're always thinking about what envelopes can we push and try different things. So what's cool about folks that jump into our club is they start off with this idea of, I love IPAs, I want to brew great IPAs. I want to brew, you know, great pilsners, and then they start get introduced to styles they may have been intimidated to purchase at a at a, you know, bottle shop, and they start coming to meetings and they start trying these new styles, and then all of a sudden, the beer world just expands for them, and they get into these, uh, you know, very different, unusual, exotic beers. Something that I kind of have always admired about Marco is he he's really into resurrecting the past. Like he he brews. Uh, some beers that you can't get like it's just you know you can find a recipe online and they just don't make it anymore like uh what was it the cop booster cop booster yeah yeah, yeah that's a good one. Which, which is just you you would never find it although i'm pretty sure i read an article in the aha today about that style marco and it's just it's just funny how you know you could resurrect the past just based on um you know reading an article on line it's just it's it's really cool and most people you can't just go to the store and resurrect the past but you could go to your uh you could go to your basement and resurrect the past literally just find these ingredients online or at your local markets and uh you could do it yeah so i, I hope i'm not rushing you but i i think people are going to be curious about these other beers here in my cooler what's uh what's number two uh the second one that we thought we'd open is um our dandelion beer uh, so okay. TJ and I, uh, we started on this venture of experimenting with, with dandelion. So um, uh, we have three versions of it that we made. And every year we try to make, a, a, we try to make some improvements on it. So the first one okay. is uh, Fine and Dandy 2016. Okay. Uh, and we brewed it in 2016. And, and the date that's on the cap there is uh, when we bottled it. So we bottled it in October of 2016. Yeah. And now you and, call this in your notes, this is, this is a vertical, which they also use in tea. So for example, I, I, I'm all into tea and they'll do something where you try uh, like an aged oolong tea from one year. And then the year after that, and the year after that to sort of study the differences for any number of reasons to see how you're, see how you're storing it, to see the effect of aging, all these different things. So we, I have three of these dandelion beers right now That's in my right. cooler. That you do, yes. And uh, and in this case, what what we hope that you'll you'll see is how uh, the beer recipe has actually evolved over the years. Uh, so in 2016, we had one interpretation of the beer, and we learned a lot about how to use dandelion, how much to use, what parts of the dandelion to use, when to add it to the beer. And so every year we, we make it, we try it, we say, all right, let's circle back and try something different. And now you can sort of um, taste some of those differences. Why would you use dandelion other than taste? Do you want to take this one or you want me to? Yeah, well, I, well, I, I, I want to hear what TJ's interpretation of this is. So going back to not being able to obtain a certain beer, one of my favorite breweries up in Vermont is, is Hill Farmstead and they brew a beer. Actually, they're, they're in the process of making it right now. It's called Vera May. And I always wanted to try it and, uh, and I couldn't get my hands on it because it's only released once a year. So, uh, instead I decided to make it. <laughs> yeah. But this, this one right here, this is the 2016. This is the first year you did this. Yes. Cause this tastes delicious to me. If, if it got better, I'm excited to see what's what's coming down because this is this is fantastic and this is perfect for the weather right now. This is a perfect beer for the weather. Yeah, actually, well, I'm I'm worried that it's going to go all downhill from here. <laughs> I, I haven't had this beer in a while, and when we first brewed um, this beer, uh, we used uh, the flowers of the dandelion, but also some of the green parts of the dandelion. And when the beer was young, it was extremely bitter. Um, and what we didn't realize at the time was. Although people eat the leaves and stems of dandelion, uh, that it, it just has a ton of bitterness. And we also hopped the beer, so that adds bitterness to it. So it, initially, it was overwhelmingly bitter. But as it aged, uh, we 
you, you can test it and taste it as a sour character to it. So it has some wild yeasts and bacteria in there that help enhance a little bit of that tartness. But as it's aged, it started to mellow out, and it is a it is a beautiful beer right now. In, I'm glad in, I have in, a whole bunch of this actually because I haven't had one in a while. Yeah, it's great. And the beautiful thing about this is the beer is alive. So the beer is constantly changing because it's alive. It has wild yeast and bacteria that are metabolizing those leftover, um, you, you know, byproducts of so the for, beer. So for people who are, are new to this and they don't, they're new to the idea of fermentation, what's, what's wild yeast and where do you get that? Do you leave the, uh, the tank out in the yard and, and the bees right. stop by and drop the wild yeast? How does that process work? Yeah, so, I mean... Uh, Marco froze. Oh, I mean, I we were breathing in yeast oh, right, right now. Oh, sorry. No. Can you you froze hear? for a second, but you're good oh, now. All right, sorry. Uh, so um, uh, right now in the air that you're breathing, there's yeast. Um, and it usually is coming off of the plants, the fruits and vegetables, the trees. Uh, there's all yeast in our environment um, everywhere. And, and uh, essentially, if you could, you could brew a beer, leave it open outside and many breweries actually do that today and, and capture that wild yeast that's in the air and ferment their beer. Uh, but as the beer industry has gotten more popular and home brewing has gotten really popular, um, companies have actually isolated these yeast strains and now you can go into your local homebrew shop and buy a very specific wild yeast. Um, I manage a uh, barrel program here in my house and uh, I'm mixing cultures all the time to just create unique um, flavor profiles that you're only going to be able to find in my basement, which is kind of cool, but that's just over time and introducing new yeasts and blending yeasts and, you know, things like that. But, um, but, uh, essentially wild yeast is in the environment. We just happen to have really great access to it today at local homebrew shops where you can buy a specific strain and do some studying on what flavor profiles you can expect from that strain of yeast, um, and bacteria too. You know what this reminds me of a little bit is that I, there are certain cultures where I've heard like you can't get the good stuff in a restaurant. You know what I mean? Like you have yeah. to sit down with somebody's mom who knows how to make it. And it, drinking this makes me think, are the best beers in America brewed at home? I would say it is, right? I mean, like some of the best beers we've had, not necessarily my own, but some of the members in our club, the beers that they brew, I would put them up against any commercial beer out there. I mean, I mentioned Mike Switzer earlier. I mean, the guy is a lager genius. If you want a German beer, you don't have to go to Germany. Just go to Newburyport because his beers are as good as anything you're getting freshly poured out in Munich. Right. I'm going to go to the 17 right now. Which um, is the, uh, it should be F and D 18 on top. Oh, okay. That's the 17. I'm saying yeah, the, the one Yakima. Three 18. Uh, yeah. Um, and so to explain that it was brewed in 2017. Okay. And we bottled it in March. Okay. Of 2018, which is what the date is. Uh, the Yakima one, this one came out of the barrel, and the the other one went in. Okay, I see. So I'm pulling out the 18. All right. What says the 18 on my cap? Yes. Uh, so, is part of the pleasure also keeping alive dying cultural traditions? In other words, you're you're talking about these kind of uh, you know these recipes that that could be lost from different places in, in Europe and around the world. Do you think about that? Do you think about the history? Well, I'm fortunate enough that I'm the first generation in the United States. My family migrated here from the Azores in the 70s, which is part of Portugal. And so I'm lucky enough to be close enough to the heritage of you made your own stuff, mm -hmm. make your own wine, you grow your own vegetables, you, um, you know, grow animals for meat, uh, so I, I was close to that growing up as a kid. So it's it's sort of in my blood that I wanted to continue those traditions. Although beer wasn't a big thing in my family, it was wine. But this is my interpretation of staying connected to those uh, cultures. And and as you guys, you know, I've mentioned before, I, I'm fortunate, very fortunate, that my wife is as tolerant as she is because this has taken over our basement, and it's a, a it's an obsession that I have. Uh, but part of it is because. You know, I'm thinking about my family and all the things that they've had to do in the past to have accessible alcohol and food and, and all that. And, and I'm just continuing it in my own way. All right. I haven't taken a sip of this yet. What, what am I expecting here? What's changed in a year as far as the process? PJ, you want to talk about what we changed? So 
we decided to take out all the green parts of the the flower and only use the petals and we used a lot of petals and where did you get you got them from like the yard you no, went out no, the forest no, oh, hang on uh, hang on oh. it, like, we, yeah you can't so for those of you that are just going to go out there and start picking dandelions um it's important that you're picking them from a place that's not contaminated at all so you don't want to go like the side of the road where all the salt is being dumped from you know wait uh snow removal or de-icing. Uh, so there's a field um, that is not too far away from where I live that's just this long meadow. And uh, TJ also was on a hike oh, where you got him from. Where was it, that uh, top I, of a hill? I got it I got it from um, uh, the Lowell Reservoir, the top of the Lowell Reservoir, because I knew that they couldn't spray there because drinking water, open top drinking water. So I decided to pick them from there. So yeah, so we're so getting did, it from places that no pesticides. Yeah. Like you, you got to be careful of that stuff. Uh, so TJ, did you pick this all yourself? Uh, Marco and I both took. A, <laughs> we we both picked a lot. Yeah. So you didn't say. you didn't bribe the kids. There wasn't some okay because because oh, I, I may have, wait, hold on I may have used my son to help me out a little bit. <laughs> okay. This so, year, this year, a couple of friends actually showed up and helped me too. Actually, yeah. There you go. They they drove by and they saw me picking flowers and they they were like, "Want me to help you?" So that was yeah, pretty Doug, wild. Doug, you've not had a good time in life until you're picking individual petals off of a piece of dandelion <laughs> and you've got several pounds of it to do. That's that's when life gets really exciting. It it sounds it. Well, let's let's uh, let's try the results. Yeah, it's totally almost, totally almost, different, but it's so mi- I, I mean, it's so mild. It's so like. And in this one, I can taste the dandelion a lot more. Oh, yes. Exactly. This it's tastes like dandelion. Medicinal. Right. But I, I think like when I was a kid, if I just grabbed the dandelion and eat it, I, I can remember that almost like bitter taste of the the sort of the white. I don't know. Is that sap? I don't know what that is. Um, but this is like very floral and light. It's not overwhelmingly floral. So it doesn't have that kind of almost like fruity taste. It's very gentle. Mm. Yeah. And this one, uh, you can not actually taste that the tartness is scaled way down in it as well and this was the first i think this is the first uh beer we put into my brett barrel my Brettanomyces barrel which is a type of yeast so we actually use this beer to season uh that barrel so it's got a like tamer more laid back uh tartness to it compared to the other one where we really tried to spice up the uh the sourness of it but also great for this weather. This is a, a summer beer for sure. I have the garbage outside, so I'm gonna turn my mute off in a second. If you guys can hear me. Um, food pairings, what does this go with? Yeah, so if you think about, um, you know, when you think about the flavor profiles of a beer, you're thinking about what it complements, right? So something that has good floral citrus notes, you're thinking salads, some types of cheeses, nuts, um, you know, lighter fish dishes, almost like um, if you were pairing something with white wine. It's got a lot of similar characters to a white wine. I agree. I was going to say white fish, 100 percent, some like a light olive oil sauce. Um, yeah, if you're thinking about the acidity level here, right, like the what are the three main parts of uh uh, fat, food, acid. It's fat, acid, and heat, right? Yeah. Is that the three? So you're thinking about like how it just complements those, uh, you know, three components of a meal. Mm. We savor in silence. This is great. That's right. <laughs> I'm moving on to the next one because I want to get through this. Where is it? Right here. I know what I'm doing this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Taking, Taking a nap. A nap. <laughs> <laughs> a good time of the year to do it <laughs> so now the yakima one is um is the brewed in 2018 okay and also <laughs> bottled in 2018 so what did you learn between 2017 and 2018 that makes this one different yeah, so this one we really scaled back on the amount of dandelion we used hmm. uh, because, um, again, so what we learn a lot is when these beers are really young. So you, you want to predict how they're going to age out, and a lot of those um, additional ingredients that you use tend to fade over time. But when this beer was young, when the last beer was young, uh, the dandelion was very intense and really powerful. 
So we said, okay, let's let's cut it in half, basically, is what we did. Yeah. We scaled it way back. And so now this one will have uh, some, probably a little bit, I haven't tasted it yet, but um, this is the second, or, um, well, in that barrel is the third generation beer that was in the barrel. Um, and so we should see an increased level of tartness, uh, but a scaled back level of um, the dandelion. It smells more honey-like. Is this going to be sweeter because it's newer? Oh, yeah. Okay. What's oh, the benefit nice. of uh, what's that? It's it's really good actually. Okay. It's, it's really nice. We, we why did would you use other than to to keep a tradition alive? Why would you use wild yeast and wild fermentation methods? Uh, primarily because we like the tartness that it delivers. Right, it adds this refreshing mm -hmm. citrus character to uh, the beers that are um, just unique. Uh, you know, most people when they think about beer, they're thinking about uh, you know those standard American lagers that are crisp and clean and easy to drink. Well, this does it, but it has complexity that you can't get in those beers. Yeah. Uh, it's a whole different flavor profile. It's a whole different experience of drinking, but also satisfies the thirst quenching, um, you know, summertime enjoyable beer experience. Are there dangers with beer drinking? In other words, because you're dealing with yeast and fermentation, do you have to worry about botulism and things like that? Do people ever get sick from this? Botulism, I don't, I don't think so, because w part of the, the process of uh, brewing beer is, is being really sanitary. Um, you know, a lot of uh, professional brewers joke around because those guys that take that leap from I'm at the homebrew level and now I'm a professional brewer, they, they say I'm, I'm really just a, 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 an exaggerated janitor right? because I'm cleaning like crazy. <laughs> I'm sanitiz sanitizing things like crazy. So if you're going to brew good beer, step one, most important thing you're going to do is make sure that stuff is clean mm. and sanitary. And that includes from, you know, before you start brewing your beer all the way through fermentation. That is the, the key to it. But there are some uh, measures that happen that sort of correct themselves for you. You boil beer. Boiling it is obviously a way to help sanitize the liquid. Uh, so one, you know, if you weren't as clean as you needed to be before you started boiling it, well, you're going to kill a lot of that stuff that, that might spoil your beer. Uh, but just like anything else, if it doesn't smell good, chances are you probably shouldn't be drinking it. Uh, so once you're going through post-fermentation, even with wild bacteria, yes, there might be some funky characters that are designed, but it should always smell pleasant. And if it doesn't smell pleasant, you probably shouldn't be drinking it. Uh, but other than, you know, people overindulging, I haven't heard of anybody that has uh, um, severely injured themselves dr just having a pint of beer. What are the biggest mistakes that people make in the beginning when they start homebrewing? Not being clean. I, 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 I yeah, just that is number one, because uh, honestly, like, uh, you know, when you're brewing certain types of beer, you don't want that wild bacteria, that wild yeast. And if you're not taking every precaution that you need to, uh, and you get an introduction of a, of a um, wild yeast, it's going to disrupt your entire beer and change the profile. Uh, and, so there and, are other things that can screw it up, but that's number one. And, and beers going forward. If you contaminate your equipment, your, 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 your fermentation equipment, you could contaminate beers in the future as well. And um, one other thing that I notice is oxygen post-fermentation. Uh, oxygen kills beer. It turns it into a cardboard mess. It's it, it, in it's dark and murky. Um, that that I I notice in a lot of the competitions that we uh, we host is oxidation is a huge uh, problem in home brewing. Okay, and and that comes from from light from people storing their vessels in an area where there's too much light. No, it comes from when you transfer your beer into another vessel to bottle it or to keg it. Uh, you, you're you're doing so so that liquid could get oxygen. So you're 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 just pouring it into another vessel and it's splashing around in there and it's it's actually oxidizing itself. Um, that 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 gas is going into that liquid, um, which pre fermentation you want because yeast needs oxidation um to to it needs needs to be needs oxygen to uh metabolize in the beginning and to multiply um but post fermentation it 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 can't it basically the yeast falls out of, of fermentation and 
that that beer is done and uh, if it if it gets oxygen the yeast isn't alive enough to to eat it yeah. um what about temperature what, what's the ideal place in the house to be brewing i'll let you take this one marco yeah um this all depends on the style of beer that you're making uh because if um you know there's this misconception that you know um you know ales and lagers are styles they're, they're really broad ranges um so a lot of ales uh, that you brew like to be fermented in the mid to up, upper 60s range uh, but then there are some uh, beers that traditionally were farmhouse beers where they didn't have temperature control and it was really hot outside uh, that they fermented at much higher temperatures things like saisons and, and different farmhouse styles of beers mm. but lagers are actually really difficult to make at the homebrew level because you have to be able to control a temperature that's in the low 50s and then be able to store a beer uh, close to freezing for a period of time. And that can be really, really difficult to do. Um, so it, it all depends on what you're trying to make, but temperature control uh, for fermentation is a huge component of being able to produce good beer because you're, the yeast is gonna produce flavors that you're looking for in a beer and they're going to produce them based on the temperature that you're fermenting them at. Interesting. I'm going to open this up to Lou in a second because Lou always has good questions. Uh, the one comment I wanted to make about this is it actually tastes to me a lot like a cider. It has a very oh. apple-like sweetness to it that I just find like a Belgian farmhouse cider, which is a style I like. Did you, did you guys have people come in who are also interested in, in other related forms like cider? Or not so much? Yes. Um... Do you want me to take this one, Marco? Uh, so, so we do have members that that brew ciders, meads, all sorts of different fermented uh, products. Uh, we we did have a member uh, that passed away last year. It was dear to all our hearts, and he made the best meads I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Mike Hand, and uh, he, he he passed away from ALS and. Um, it's 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 taken its toll on us but we've kind of rallied through it and we tried to raise some money for the als foundation and um but 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 yeah that we we all we all we all just ferment everything i ferment foods marco ferments foods i make hot hot uh hot sauce i make kimchi sauerkraut hold, hold on a minute. let's pour one more i want to okay. dig in on the fermentation aspect and then I will open up to Lou because this is uh, this is important. So what's the next one? Let's do Creek next. Okay. Tell, for people who don't know what a Creek is, what is this? Um, a Creek is a, a Lambic, which is a Belgian-style beer uh, that is uh, dosed with cherries. And so this beer comes from my um, – I have what's called a Solera barrel, which is – a uh, barrel that I continuously add new beer to. So it's a 10 gallon barrel. Every year I remove five gallons and I add five gallons. So there's a portion of the original beer always in future beers that come out of it. Uh, but it's just this continuously um, developing uh, wild bacteria, wild yeast beer that continues to grow. And then when I pull it out, I'll usually find some interesting uh, fruit additions or different ways to complement the beer. So in this case, was cherry, which uh, in Belgium is called a creek. Yeah. So I want to ask about fermentation because it seems there are, it, there seems like when people get into fermenting foods, they're drawn in. It can be a little bit addicting and it doesn't matter whether it's tempeh or yogurt or kefir or beer. What, do you think about that? Do you think about why, what is it about fermentation that has this hold on our imaginations or is so appealing to our palates? For, for for me, it was more of a health thing because I, I I I personally I have a lot of gut issues and that um, eating fermented foods really helped that for me. Um, so I I do try to make as much fermented foods at home because it's 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 cheap and easy. If you try to buy it at the market, it's really expensive. But I, I can I can make a fermented sauerkraut that can last me months uh and and it will keep my my microbiome my gut microbiome healthy for um for months definitely the the benefits of pro and prebiotics that are in fermented foods that are, are great for gut health these beers that we're trying today also have those characteristics 
Uh, so fermented foods are just known to be very healthy. But uh, what makes um, what ferments fermented foods is lactobacillus, which is also one of the bacteria that's inside of these beers. And that's what creates that sort of tart, sour character. And it actually just adds a really great flavor to foods, too. So when you ferment some of these foods like green beans or carrots or hot sauces, you get that lacto tartness that's just really pleasant and enjoyable. Yeah, this is fantastic. This is this. And once again, the body is just perfect. It's super silky, super smooth, uh, sweet, but not overly sweet. It's not overly sour, even though it's a sour beer. It's a very pleasant level of like it's there to enjoy, but it doesn't, uh, you know, slice your, your tongue like a paper cut or something. I think the last one killed your palate because <laughs> this one, <laughs> this one is pretty tart. Yeah, but uh, I, to me, this. But, but I like sour food, so maybe it's, yeah. for for me, it's not. Um, it's and these not, guys know, like I love sour beers. I brew a lot of sour beers, and I love sour beer that just like destroys your glands. Sour, yeah. you know, really, really low pHs to to tear yeah. it up. I love it. I, I've had some commercial uh, lambics and creeks and stuff before too, uh, and they just don't. There's there's something kind of flat and almost metallic about a lot of them which this doesn't have. This tastes so clean to me. That makes me feel right. That warms my heart. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> I mean, they that. did something right. Uh, because I, I don't even think I'm technically allowed to call it a Lambic because it's not in Belgium, but, yeah. but we'll go with that. Um, yeah, well, whatever you, whatever you call this thing, it's, it's delicious. Lou, do you have questions for our guests? Yeah, let's start with TJ. And what I want to get is for someone like myself, who's a neophyte at this and has, you know, has some basic idea of what goes on in a beer. Talk about brewing your first batch of beer, and if you want to go from Marco brewing it with a pot and a spoon or something a little more sophisticated, just give me the process. Give me the primer. How do you brew a batch of beer? So there, there's some basic ingredients. So you got you have malts, which are basically grains, which are, at, at, when you start, you, you can buy malt extract, which is basically you skip the mashing of the malts. You, you, you don't have to do that. They already did that for you. And they condensed it down to uh, basically either a syrup or a dry powder. And you mix that with water and you, well, you heat it, you heat it up to a certain temperature and um, then you, you boil it basically. Uh, and then you start adding your hops, which is the second ingredient, water being the first, actually. Um, you add your hops, and that would, is what gives you your bitterness. It gives you some, um, so, some flavor, some aromas. Um, and then you add your yeast, which in the past, they didn't have to add it because it just spontaneously fermented. And it was some beautiful, like the gods just <laughs> blessed it. And in uh, and, 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 that happens at a lower temperature though you cool it down to like marco said depending on the yeast uh 68 degrees for a regular brewer's yeast um and and then you have your fermentation process and then you let it sit and you try to keep that temperature because temperature fluctuations whether you're brewing at high temperatures low temperatures or in the middle temperature fluctuations can really impact flavor because it stresses out the yeast because they like a certain temperature um so if the yeast gets stressed, they can put out by, you know, byproducts that are just not pleasant in beer. Uh, and then you can either bottle it, keg it, and serve it to your neighbors, and hopefully they can palate it. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier that you were talking about the importance of water, and I think this is something in anything we ingest, a la colon, the whole culinary spectrum, we don't pay enough attention to water and water quality. So talk a little bit about that and how important that is. Um, so that's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. I design water treatment plants. Yeah. So, uh, you know, most, most municipalities have really good water. You know, like we, we, we live in Massachusetts. I'm pretty sure everybody here lives in Massachusetts. The MWRA has the best water probably on the planet. Um, so if you're, if you're getting your water from them, uh, it's important just to get a water, um, uh, a, a water profile from your, uh, municipality or, or you can test it yourself um, you can get a test kit online um, and then you know your baseline how, how how many minerals what kinds of contaminants in it but the main thing is just filtering because you don't want chlorine you don't want any of those different things that are gonna uh, they're really gonna impact your beer chlorine especially uh, it just kills beer um, 
So one way to do it is if you do have chlorine in your water and you don't have a good filter, you can use canoe tablets. You, you just basically fill up a pot, put canoe tablets in it and let it uh, let the chlorine gas off overnight or uh, a carbon filter works great. I've been using carbon filters for years and have no problem. Um, but it's, it's important to go find your baseline and then figure out what water profile you're looking for. And it's based on the different types of beer. Um, I don't want to go too deep yep. into it. <laughs> I can it's talk something for important hours. to remember. What, what's important to remember, because this, this can sound really intimidating. If somebody's watching this and has never brewed a beer before and is thinking about starting to brew beer, um, this can sound really intimidating. Water profile is important. And that's important when you want to take your beer game to an, uh, another level. You can make really great beer by just using water you have at home and just making sure you're following two really basic steps fresh ingredients and keep it clean if you can do those two things you'll be in good shape and then you can tweak the other stuff later uh, but ultimately if you just make sure everything's sanitized and clean and that you're uh, using as fresh of ingredients as you can get at the end of the day it's going to be beer it'll be drinkable and it'll be really pleasant probably better than a lot of stuff you can get um, out on the shelves but right now uh, getting into water uh, is a, is the next level of it. That's when you really want to take your beer game and start to fine tune the craft and and start to create beers that are um, really specific to regions of the world. Because what happens is is uh, what makes beers unique. Like Sam Adams, the, a, a beer that everybody knows. Part of what made Sam Adams unique was the water that they were using. So even though Sam Adams isn't really brewing beer in Boston anymore, they brew it out in the Midwest. They're recreating that Boston water in the midwest but that's because they've figured out that that's what made their beer great when they moved they realized hey our beer's not tasting the same why isn't it tasting the same that's because the water profile was different so they've learned that they've developed it and they've now recreated it you don't have to worry about it uh, just worry about keeping it clean and use fresh ingredients so we're, we're almost running out of time i just poured beer number six so i want to hear about beer number six uh but before i do that i have to ask uh tj since you you uh mentioned water treatment and I'm the editor of Merrimack Valley Magazine. Do you work with the Merrimack River? Um, I, I design water treatment plants all over the world. Right now, I'm working on one in Mongolia. Okay. Um, I, I work for a fairly big, one of the okay. biggest. Does that mean you get to firm. visit Mongolia, or you're just uh, designing from afar? Maybe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Safe travels. All right, so what's, uh, what's in number six? Uh, so uh, beer number six is a uh, Brett fermented. When, and we say Brett, we're abbreviating Brettanomyces, uh, uh, which is a wild yeast. Uh, Brett fermented Kolsch, which a Kolsch beer is a really light, easy drinking beer. And this one, we uh, fermented it like the traditional farmhouse beers where we did it at higher temperatures. And then we introduced some fresh ingredients. We added some fresh sage and lemon thyme and lemon peel. Uh, so that it creates these sort of uh, herbal, floral, citrus characters. And again, it's just a really easy drinking beer. Yeah, I, this is much more herbal. This tastes in a good way like my garden. Um, that was what we were going for. So yeah, yeah. It, it, tastes, it tastes like a nice, uh, beautiful garden in, in, you know, two inches in a glass. <laughs> we, uh, uh, one thing that we'll do, as, uh, because TJ and I, I think we'll probably try to brew this beer again, uh, um, I brewed this beer um, several years ago, slightly different than what you're trying today, as an homage to my heritage, uh, because it was it reminded me of my grandparents and uh, them having these fresh herbs and fresh vegetables in their garden. So I thought, hey, let me uh, brew a beer that honors them. And uh, and, and we, I called it Avo, which is uh, grandma in Portuguese. TJ really loved that beer when I made it. He said, hey, let's Let's brew it together. We tweaked it a little bit. We'll probably go back to way, the way that it was before because what we'd like to see in it is a little bit more of that tartness because some of those herbal floral characters uh, would be complemented so amazing if it had a little bit more tartness. Yeah, this, this, is, this is beautiful. So anyways, guys, thank you so much. If you want to learn more, uh, go to mbmag.net and read the article on these guys. You can search for it because um, there's more in the article than we covered here. This is fantastic. I really, really appreciate you letting me speak with you and, and learn about these. And obviously for the beer, thank you so much. This is, this is delicious. Uh, next week on the show, we're going to have T.R. Moynihan, who's a novelist. She wrote a book called Sweet, Sweet Jane, 
if you haven't read it, it's uh, like a 1970s detective fiction novel set in Lowell, and it's fantastic. So if you really want to get ready for next week, go to Amazon, order a copy of Sweet Sweet Jane, that's J-A-Y-N-E, and get ready for that. I'm really looking forward to speaking with her. She's a really interesting person. Guys, 